Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and TechAdvice.life video interview. I'm joined today by Alexander Burton. He is the James Dyson Award winner for Australia, the national award winner for 2023, and he's one of the global top 20 finalists for the international award, and he's the inventor of Reaver, which makes existing fossil-based fuel cars fully hybridized. Welcome to the program. Hey Alex, thanks for having me. Thank you for taking the time. Now, a huge congratulations for taking at the National James Dyson Award and for being a global top 20 finalist. I'll be embedding the two-minute video that the James Dyson Award YouTube page has published about your award-winning entry, but let's get straight to it. What does Reva stand for, and what is the short version, before we go into the longer version, of how you convert a fossil fuel car into a hybrid car? Um, yeah, so REV stands for Rapid Electric Vehicle Retrofits, um, which is the whole goal of the project is to get our petrol cars over to electric um, as soon as possible. Um, and so the way it works, um, it's 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 a fairly simple system. Um, there's not a whole lot of magic going on, but it's putting two motors just in your rear two wheels mm -hmm. um, and putting a battery in your boot or in your wheel well. Um, and that system can then uh, provide assistance to the vehicle and take most of the work away from the petrol engine. Um, and so you have your car largely electric. Um, yeah. So if we go into more detail, what's the longer version of how this technology works and the big challenges that you over you had to overcome to make this a reality? Um, yeah, there are definitely a few. I mean, there's been some similar things and there's obviously retrofits that exist. Um, the, the biggest challenge with retrofits is always dealing with the amount of variation across vehicles. Obviously, they're incredibly um, different across mm -hmm. the whole market. Um, and so while we're not going to target every single vehicle, we we're looking at sort of, well, I was looking at how many vehicles can we get with as minimal variations in the motor as possible. Um, and so that's sort of what led us to um, the in-wheel drive and keeping it mostly outside the vehicle and, and really simple, yeah. And if you watch the uh, the video uh, that is at the James Dyson YouTube page, I mean, you can see that the motor fits where the disc's brakes are. So it sort of fits on, on top of that or next to it. And as you were saying, that is what is driving the the motor and you've got the, the battery in the wheel well. Uh, I mean, what sort of a motor fits into that space? It's obviously different from a, the conventional engine that we're all familiar with. Yeah, yeah. So part of the innovation, I guess you'd say, is the we're using axial flux motors. So they are really, really good with power density and torque density. Um, so your your standard motor is more of a, a cylinder, and it's um, quite easy to manufacture. There's obviously um, a lot of precedent, and it's very established, but it's not that great for when you want a lot of torque. It's good with speed, um, but in this application, you really want because it's direct drive, a huge amount of power and that moment. Um, and so that's why we've chosen uh, Axial Flux. And it also happens to fit this space really well. So we've got a pancake sort of cylindrical um, sized area and void that we're filling. Um, and Axial Flux motors fit this perfectly. Yeah. And and clearly the, the motor doesn't slip when you're going uphill or if you've got a particularly heavy car or you're towing a big load. It, it's got enough oomph to to stay yeah. in one piece and, and really drive the car. Yeah, yeah, well, it has to. Um, and that's like part of, um, I guess, advertising it and it being viable is that it has a huge amount of torque um, and it's it's quite simple to install and it, it uses the existing strength um, of the, the vehicle, yeah. So how far away is your invention from commercialization? You know, will I be able to reliably retrofit it in my car in the next, you know, two to five years, for example? And what would such a retrofit uh, cost end users in theory? Um, yeah, so we're sort of the, the goal is to have some beta kits ready late next year. Um, and so this is going to take obviously a lot of prototyping and R&D and connections. Um, there's definitely some regulatory hurdles as well. Um, so making friends now is pretty important. Um, but yeah, I think we, we'll have some some test kits ready late next year. Um, that two to five year uh, schedule is, I think, really good. And I think really important also for this having the most impact as we're in this transition period over to electric um, to avoid a huge amount of manufacturing emissions. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. There's There's billions of cars on the road. And if you could... 
uh, convert a, a huge number of them inexpensively to to be uh, you know hybrid or partially electric. That's going to be a massive uh, saver for the environment and for people's wallets. Yeah. Well, yeah, we we definitely think so. Um, yeah. yeah. So how much could uh, how much petrol or diesel could users expect to save per tank? Or I guess another way of asking is how many extra kilometers per tank do you think an everyday user would expect to drive? Uh, once this technology is installed? Yeah, so the main goal is extending the mileage of the vehicle, um, particularly in the commuting range. Um, that's where you'll get the most bang for your buck with your investment in terms of batteries, controllers, and everything. Um, so within a sort of 100, 150 kilometer range, we hope to be able to get mileage of like one liter per 100 kilometers. Um, really, all your petrol engine's doing is just keeping the systems of the car happy. But the motor, the electric motor is going to do most of the work, um, regeneration, um, acceleration, and just cruising. Yeah. And uh, how often would you have to charge the battery, or is it just being continuously charged by the fact that the petrol motor is running and you've got that brake regeneration and and those technologies? Um, so it is a, a plug-in kit, so you would be charging it um, and, and just putting in, you know, ideally renewable energy into the vehicle, um, and that, that's what will get you that huge range and, and mileage. And how long would it take to recharge in theory? Depends what you're charging it off. Um, we, we've obviously got a lot of fast chargers coming out that would fill this battery up in 10 minutes. Um, but if you just offer a standard outlet, um, that'll be doing, you know, three kilowatts. Um, so do the math, I think it's like five hours so overnight. Yeah. Sure, yeah. But, I mean, in theory, it's it's roughly equivalent to what uh, an electric car might be depending on its battery capacity. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you're, you're really just charging it up as much as you've drained it. So yeah. it could be a lot shorter. Um, a lot of people are commuting, you know, 30, 40 kilometres. Yeah. And could this technology be used in large trucks that are on Australian and global highway so that they can also reap the benefits of these hybrid technologies? Oh, yeah. I mean, this that would be a really, really awesome um, application for this. There's obviously like Australia is super reliant on trucks and everything for all our freight. Um, and there's not really any plan in place to electrify them at the moment. Um, so this would be a, an awesome application. Uh, the kit would definitely need some modifications. And I think we'd need to look at uh, trucks in isolation. Um, but yeah, super cool application fleets as well. Yeah, really cool retrofit. Yeah, I see on the back of trucks as I'm driving between Canberra and Sydney. It says, you know, without trucks, Australia stops. So, uh, and yeah. you know, you could you can easily spend a couple hundred grand on a new truck, but I mean, a retrofit would be you know vastly cheaper. So, what yeah. actually drew you into uh, engineering and invention? Um, oh, it's hard to say. I think partly it was my dad showing me like a when I was like five, like a water. Um, there's there's this whole community uh, with water rockets. Um, and that, that was super, super cool. And I think that got me tinkering super young. Um, and it's a really great space to be in the whole maker space. And I think I'm also a fairly technical sort of person. I'm drawn to the technical problems and solving them. Um, so I think that got me into it. And then it was like, you know, this, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And so how did you uh, come up with the idea to create your own, uh, hybridization kit? Um, well, it just started off with us wanting to retrofit the car. Um, petrol prices are super high. Um, we want to be a bit nicer to the planet and our car's aging. Um, so like, um, maintenance is getting more expensive. Um, so it's like the main thing at the moment, main option is buying an EV, but that's like a forty, fifty thousand dollars adventure. Um, and retrofits are the same, if not more, but in theory, retrofits make way more sense because you're just reusing most of what's there. Um, so that was sort of sent me down the path of doing it myself. And then it was like, how can we do this quickly and cheaply and um, in somehow incorporate um, the new emerging axial flux technologies? And that's sort of how I got here. And so how did you hear about the James Dyson Awards? Um, so I actually heard it through uni. Um, I've been working on this project for a few years, but around seven months ago, um, I sort of heard about it and I was like, oh, that could that work. 
Yeah, this would be a, a great thing to enter into yeah. the awards. Yeah, <laughs> and and of course it was. I mean, you won the national yeah. award, and now you're a global <laughs> top twenty finalist. I mean, you, uh, if, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you uh, if you win this award, then uh, it obviously sets you on the path towards hopefully being able to commercialize it. And I'll ask you about that, that in a moment. But you know, without necessarily giving any secrets away, you know, what other huge problems and pain points are you setting your mind to solving, <laughs> or is all of your focus on making Reva a commercial reality? whether you win the uh, Global James Dyson Award or not, uh, after having won this national award. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many things in sustainability that I think are challenges that are really interesting and intriguing to solve. Like there's storage issues, there's generation issues. Um, so I think that's where like a huge amount of engineering stuff's going to go to. And I'm interested in all that. But I think the the focus is obviously going to be on Reva for the foreseeable future and getting that to the uh, uh, commercially viable standpoint. Um, so yeah, I think that's mostly going to be the focus. The pain points are, are definitely going to be, I think, regulatory. Um, most of the challenges will be engineering and, and R and D. Yeah. And what sort of uh, batteries are you using at the moment? Presumably some form of lithium ion. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking at life PO4, um, which is sort of like lithium ion, but it's quite nice because it's got a much longer endurance and safety than lithium ion. So th those are the two main issues with like your current sort of Tesla packs and stuff is that they're, they um, sort of wear out sorry, quite quickly. Yeah. Um, and they are quite dangerous as well. So it was like, we'd like to avoid that from the outset. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've been hearing a lot about uh, lithium ion battery fires. Uh, in fact, uh, one uh, other video interview that I've done is with a gentleman called Charlie Welch. And he's got a company called Zapbat, Z-A-P-B-A-T-T. -T. If you do a yeah. search for uh, Zap Bat, Charlie Welch, and then my name on YouTube, or you just look at techadvice.life, you'll see that I've done a video interview with him, and his technology uses something called lithium titanate, which has over 15,000 charge cycles, so a 25-year lifespan. It's been used by NASA and the military for years. If you damage it, it does not have a runaway thermal explosion. It recharges to full in about 20 minutes. And it's a bit more expensive than, than current technologies, but obviously uh, they're scaling it up with uh, people like... Well, they're scaling it, and that's going to bring the, the price down. And they've got Toshiba as a partner. So um, definitely that would be uh, something that could make your invention even better. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, like, I think battery, we're going to see a lot of innovations in battery technology because there's obviously, yeah. like, so much demand for it. And it's such a kind of bottleneck for so many things at the moment. Um, so I think we're, that, that'll be super, super cool to see and, and the price coming down and everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even with Life PO4, like, we've seen that, I think reducing price over the last two decades, one decade, like down to a tenth its original price. Yeah. And so like if it can keeps keeps that trajectory, then that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, will uh Reaver be a commercial company anytime soon that we can invest in? Yep, that's that's the plan. So we're just in the process now of setting up a company and shares and maybe doing some crowdfunding as well. Um, that's all really cool. And I've had people messaging me sort of saying like this would they're very interested so yeah. I've had a lot of people through the site um and yeah so getting that set up yeah so what advice do you have for young students and inventors inspired by the awards and winners like yourself who want to change the world for the better i think just make make stuff like um just go for it like if you've got an idea um and you start sort of looking at making it and i think pursuing it you're gonna learn like so much whatever happens um like you're learning what you don't know as well as you know what you do and i think yeah just make some make stuff yeah. Yeah. Get that, well as they say uh you know there's never a perfect time the perfect time to start is now <laughs> yeah, just do it. go for it yeah and i know you mentioned a couple of obstacles before but were there any other obstacles that uh, you want to share and any other pro tips for beginners mm. Um, like with starting up the Revit project? Well, yeah, with you know, with being an innovator, being a, an engineer, starting the project, entering the awards. I mean, sort of any 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 last sort of words around that process for for people who are inspired by your success. Yeah, I mean, I think the the key is to find something that you're interested in and really motivated to pursue. Um, if if your motivations aren't right from the outset, it's you're, it's probably never going to go that far. Um, so I think finding something you're really passionate about and motivated to pursue will mean that you'll always have that motivation um, and be willing to put aside the time to develop it. Yeah. 
Now, as we get towards the end of the interview, I always like to ask the people I'm speaking with if you could please share a memory of your first personal computer. First personal computer. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that was when I was like seven um, and my parents brought out like the really clunky Windows laptop. Um, our house looked completely different. Um, and we played this game on it where you'd like move and drop blocks. It was a little bit like Tetris, but with Lego. And I remember that really vividly and it was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, my second last question is to always ask if you could please share some of the best advice you've received in life to help you get where you are today. Um, yeah, best, best advice. I think just, yeah, be willing to take risks and, um, uh, make friends. Don't, don't sort of break bridges. Um, and yeah, just give it your best. Um, don't be afraid to pursue stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're still pretty young, so you probably, there's lots of life lessons yet <laughs> yeah. to be learned. Normally I'm asking, uh, <laughs> you know, seasoned CEOs or executives who are decades older, but, but even yeah. so, even so, you know, that's still good advice. I really appreciate that. So what is your final message to the viewers and the readers and the people who are all eagerly awaiting Reva's release so they can enjoy the savings and benefits? Yeah. Um, I guess just follow us. Um, we've got socials. We've got a website, Reva.tech. Um, check it out. We'll, we'll have a newsletter soon. Um, and yeah, look forward to that coming soon. Well, best of luck with the International James Dyson Awards. I do hope you win. Either way, I hope you're able to commercialize this quickly. It sounds like an awesome, awesome project. You're a very deserving national award winner. And uh, keep up the great work. And I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me, Alex. Thank you very much, Alex. Bye-bye.